This is how the world conspired. Yes, I got it, I got it, I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I went off on a tangent in my head then and I couldn't remember what the original point was. It's about the bit, yeah, okay. Hi, I'm Mishkin Fitzgerald. I'm the lead singer of Bird Eats Baby. I've been doing this project for 13 years now and this documentary is all about our latest album, The World Conspires. So this is our fifth album and it's our most ambitious and complex one to date. Uh, we've decided to do a documentary about it because it's a really long album, it's got many layers to it, um, both musically and lyrically, so we thought it was time to uh, give our fans a little bit of a behind the scenes look at this monster of an album and this is this is that documentary. So The World Conspires opens up with a song called Hold Your Breath. Um, it's very uh, holy sounding, like you're entering a church on Christmas morning, but then it quite quickly drops into um, a heavy metal track called Painkiller. And the album kind of snakes through a load of different sounds and vibes um, before it gets to the end, which is very, very uh, stripped back and vulnerable sounding. So you want to be a soldier? From the halfway point of the album towards the end, it takes quite a different um, sound. There's some very, very uh, quiet songs like you've got ropes which is quite introverted and lush and beautiful I've seen the ending in my dreams um, and then you've got some really uh, political punk music in there with kill no one you look in the eyes of another when the lies and the chemicals are in your mouth your mouth is a key to the heart The album finishes with a really small song called Look Away, which was recorded with a hurdy-gurdy. It's an instrument we uh, haven't used, but was really fun. It's just a, yeah, a very, very bleak kind of end to the album, brings it to a close. The album is a concept album, I would say. When we were writing the album, there were many things going on in our personal lives and also politically in the world that felt like everything was conspiring against us. So that's why we decided with that title. Uh, we've almost consistently put out an album every two years since we started the band, but this one took an unusually long time. We uh, changed members, the band completely fell apart and was put back together. It was just an incredibly difficult road. The band nearly ended um, and instead We've come through it all with this huge album, but I think you can hear that it was a difficult album to write, that it's not an easy album on the ear, and although it gives back a lot, um, it's definitely something that needs um, attention when you listen to it. It's not something that's just going to pass you by. I feel like it's our best and our most honest, and definitely our most musically interesting too. I think after Tanta Furia, when the band was going through this kind of like rough time, one of the things that did make us grow together, the remaining members, was that we started to collaborate a lot more on the songwriting even further. So this is the first time that Gary has sung on an album where you can really hear him. He's got his own solo singing part, which is the first time he's done that. There's also a lot more heavy metal guitar riffs that he's written and Hannah has taken on some new instruments as well. She's taken on um, a harp, and she plays cello in this album as well, so that she's basically doing three instruments and some singing as well. So Also our new drummer Anna, although she wasn't recording on this record, she's now taken the songs to a new level when we play live. She's embellished the drums even further and added some really cool rhythmical things. Um, there's some metric modulation she does on Bad Blood, which is very, very cool. And it's already now given us more ideas for the next record that we can write, which I think is going to be quite drum heavy, it's going to be very tribal and um, going even further towards sort of progressive areas that we haven't been before. As you can see I've got a rather beautiful large printing of the artwork from The World Conspires, the front cover. 
I feel very strongly about all the covers for the albums that we've done. They've all been ideas that I've had in my head and then had to try and manifest. But I've been lucky enough to work with this amazing artist, Fausto Giruso. Uh, we first worked with him in 2015 or 2014. And then I approached him to do a cover piece and he did The Bullet Within. Um, and also Tantifuria and now this one as well. He also redesigned our logo quite recently, which has become a more of an occult symbol now rather than just a band name. The logo I had in my mind was just going to be a sort of star shape. Um, I'm quite obsessed with symbology and um, there was this like really beautiful sort of, I think it's a demon trap that I've seen uh, with an Enochian script and demon script. It was just really beautiful. So I sent him that and said, would you create something similar for Bird Eats Baby? But instead of having all the symbols of uh, the demons and the angels, could you create symbols based around our songs? So you can see on the logo, you've got uh, a noose for, I always hang myself with the same rope. There's an anchor for the song Anchor. There's a lighthouse for the lighthouse. Um, and the more you study it, the more you see. And he's managed to include so much of the symbols from our music into that one logo. It's just now so meaningful when you look at it, you, you can't forget it, which is really, really a beautiful thing that he's created. In fact, Gary has a version of it tattooed on his shoulder now, which is pretty cool. Anyway, back to the cover artwork. As you can see, it's uh, two lovers in the middle. What I said to Jack was, I wanted him to encapsulate the, the final moments before the apocalypse completely consumes them. So it's supposed to be about this eternal embrace, just this last moment where you both know you're gonna die, but you're embracing it anyway, and you're just letting go. So you can see he's got like the, the birds which you always try and get on everybody's baby cover and the two lovers being wrapped up by a snake which is kind of the evil that's consuming them and then these crying angels around the bottom that are just mourning the death of, of everything and he's made it absolutely beautiful exactly how I pictured it in my mind. So the concept of the world conspires on an artistic level, if you wanted to create it into a fantasy story, it is the final moments between two lovers before they die. You can hear at the beginning, Hold Your Breath is a sort of song of hope and it's about falling in love. Then it goes through all these twists and turns where there's betrayal and heartache, grief, loss, death, revenge, everything, and then it just ends with these final moments. Yeah, cheery stuff as always from the heart of Bird Eats Baby, but that's what it means to me and I think um, Fausto has done this incredible work. Um, he always takes my ideas and makes them into something that I would never have seen and it's always beautiful and perfect. So we've managed to include quite a lot of Brighton in our videos. It's definitely become an integral part of our music. So for Eulogy there's uh, quite a lot of scenes of Brighton where I'm just wandering about aimlessly um, and drunkenly and you can see a lot of those iconic places in Brighton like the Pavilion and the Brighton Pier and some of the um, wooded areas in Brighton. You can see that in Eulogy as well. But also Feast of Hammers, we shot up at Moleskine Woods as we did Box of Razor Blades more recently. But yeah, Brighton, it's managed to sneak its way into many a Bird Eats Baby video. I moved to Brighton when I was 18. I felt that I had a bit of a sheltered upbringing and I wanted to explore other things. Brighton was a perfect place for that. I started, you know, dyeing my hair and getting tattoos <laughs> and I fit right in. And uh, I always wanted to start a band and it was the perfect place to do that. Brighton's got a really vibrant and happy side to it. It's, it's kind of a really, really happening city, but it does have quite a dark, uh, underside to it. It's very easy to get led astray. I think Brighton can twist you a little bit and if you're not a strong person and you don't know what you're doing with your life it's very easy to get lost. So yeah it's got this real dark side to it but I kind of like it because of that. I feel Brighton is a place I can be myself and not be judged and I can also create my music and it's, it's, it's accepted and it's really easy to write music when you're here because it's just so inspiring to be right by the sea and also right in the middle of the countryside. It's uh, really witchy up here. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you can just really get lost in, um, in this space. I can't see myself going anywhere else anytime soon, but maybe somewhere in the desert one day. Down in the desert of Nevada. 
So we're lucky enough in Birdie's Baby to have uh, this website called Patreon. Um, it's working really well for us. We've been doing it for about four years now, I think, maybe more. It's a website where your fans can help support you financially by pledging a certain amount every month to get certain things. But it's just been really, really brilliant to be supported by your core fan base. Um, we're able to fund music videos, tours, all kind of stuff. And one of the things we did was uh, this session up in London at the Roland Studios. And so here's a little clip of that. Okay, this song's called Hurricane. It will be in a second. Oh, it will be. Yeah. <laughs> Not this song, yeah. this isn't a song, this is all we the silence. We use a program called Logic and sometimes it's a see you next Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, this is my normal volume. Just a little, little bit more. <laughs> Too much smoke in the ganja. It's not my fault. It's <laughs> my shout line. So. Well, how could it not be special if it's an album that you've poured so much of yourself into? I mean, all the albums are special as well, but this one in particular means so much because I think, you know, there was a time during the middle of writing it where I thought the band would end and I thought like a lot of things in my life would end and I wasn't in a very good place. So to come through the other side of that and have a beautiful album is something to be proud of. It's not special. <laughs> I'm joking. Sorry. <laughs> this album's very different. I think as a band everyone's gone through a lot of turmoil and this album's the result of that. It's like the world was just throwing obstacles in our way and that was a joke between us. It's like the world's conspiring against us. It was never meant to be an album title. Never thought the album would come about anyway so. Well we lost our drummer at the time who was also our producer so that was a bit of a blow to the band and the whole band nearly fell apart actually. It was a pretty dark time but we decided to get through it and to you know, we just poured all of that frustration into the songs. It was a really difficult album just to get off the ground anyway because th that happened kind of halfway through the writing process and we'd already started recording as well. And then there was loads of personal issues going on in the band and in my life definitely that just every time I tried to take a step forward something would just throw me sideways and the same thing was going on in Gary's life and Hannah's life and it was just, you know, everybody seemed to be going through such a rough time so... it's 
quite political, but also I would say far more hard on sleeve than any other Bird It's Baby albums have been before. The actual title was based on when Mish and I were trying to get together as a couple, but it was just the way things were transpiring initially, there was always obstacles in our way. Even trying to have the energy to put into writing the music was just such a, a you know, it, it was just painful every single step of it, loads of things went wrong. And every time we tried to stop being together it ended up being impossible so we try and get together again and this kept on going round in circles. And eventually the world stopped conspiring and we got together and we wrote an album and called it The World Conspires. That's what it means. You know, we were recording for days and days and days and sometimes ideas just wouldn't come off, the lyrics were hard to write, everything was conspiring against us and uh, yeah, I guess that kind of sums it up. Yeah, I think as a band, um, the songwriting's really grown since I joined it five years ago. But then it's got added depth as well, it's, it's a number of things, it's, it's a slightly cheesy concept that the world ending and two lovers getting together, that's kind of what's, there's a theme going through the album. And that's kind of what the name of the album means, The World Conspires. Like the world's falling apart, but these two people are still together, so it's um, semi-biographical. Yeah, it's kind of an album of disaster. Do you know what, it's just like, I think every good album tells a really, uh, you know, fantastic story. I'm like fascinated with, with storytelling, so I really love it when an album has something that's a little bit deeper than just a bunch of songs. And I think with The World Conspires, this particular story, it does open up with this sort of really hopeful kind of church-like song. And then it, you just get straight away track two, you're just like diving into this really dark kind of maelstrom. And then you go through all of these twists and turns and then at the end you think that there's this last glimmer of hope and then it's just sort of kind of comes to a really bleak sort of cold dark ending um, so I think that's that's you know the concept of the record really is it's a story where everything conspires against you and it unfortunately has a tragic end <laughs> I think uh, The World Conspires is a special album to me because musically it's very complex. From a personal viewpoint it's taken me very much out of my comfort zone and like introduced a very very creative style of string writing that I haven't really done before um, in terms of arrangements. What it means to me is everything that tried to get in our way. So it's incredibly special to me because it represents going through like I don't know, fire and coming out the other side and being being stronger for it and still having uh, an amazing band and my best friends at my side. So, you know, that's why it's special. Okay. I was, far, I was a lot more involved in the World Conspires in the writing of the album. Because as it was being written, uh, me and Mish were spending a lot more time with each other. We were on tour, I think, three times that year. There was two German tours, or two European tours. There was an American tour. We were writing songs, kind of, for each other and for the album. I had a lot more involvement on it because I was just always there. It's the next step towards, uh, I think, uh, progressive music. Every Buddy's Baby album has taken a turn that has been slightly unexpected. Early Buddy's Baby stuff was really stripped back and it was almost a bit cabaret and tongue in cheek. To shake this body off, a feather to the storm, the hands that break the soul. A lot of simple chord progressions and ideas. The songs were shorter <clears throat> and it was easily executed. Um, now the band has grown so much. This last album, I mean, it's just such a huge step away from where we first began. I think each album is like a giant leap for us, really. Um, I really enjoyed working with Gary on songwriting because um, what we're able to do is like take some piano lines that don't sound very good on that and translate them over to the guitar and vice versa. So we're kind of writing, you know, for each other's instruments on different instruments and you just get these really cool lines that maybe you wouldn't have written if they were just writing for guitar. So it was easier to bounce ideas off each other. It was easy to go to each other and say, I've got this idea, I've got this riff, she's got these lyrics, put these chords together, we all work together and eventually come together as the album. That's what the result of it. What happened over that two, three year period. I think I brought all the real like classical stamps to the record. 
probably like 80% of the string parts had a classical composer in mind, which is something pretty new to me, I guess. I was very creative with this album in a way that I haven't really been that creative with Bird Eats Baby stuff in the past. But for this album, I really went to town on my influences really and worked hard finding really beautiful melodies for some of them and really channeling a vast scope of classical instrumentation. This album's different than the previous one because it's got different instruments. We've got Hannah playing the harp, she plays cello as well. I've developed my vocal style a lot further as well. This time I'm doing some screen vocals which I've never done before. Also a bit of a higher range that I hadn't uh, previously done. Lady Grey saw me definitely pushing uh, my vocal style to like the extreme and Painkiller too. So Gary's playing a lot more guitar, there's a lot more riffs to it. And I just think the songs have been allowed to develop this time, whereas previously we always executed them quite quickly and just got to the point. I would say I brought Russia to the table. <laughs> a lot of the composers that were influential to the album were Russian. Stravinsky was referenced in The World Conspires, his Rite of Spring. Um, that was Gary's idea. But that's with the really <laughs> kind of violence. <laughs> we used the Tchaikovsky piece at the end of Kill No One that's just really, really obnoxious. lyrical violin section in the middle of Bad Blood is Tchaikovsky influenced as well and then finally the one I'm most proud of is um, Rachmaninoff riff at the end of The World Conspires which is a very famous riff from his um, most famous piano concerto. Gary what key is it in? The World Conspires? Yeah. F minor. Okay so it's <laughs> That's all of it that we use. <laughs> Hannah gets me into some really good classical stuff. Tchaikovsky was really cool, but um, mostly I've just been listening and playing loads of Rachmaninoff over the last few years, trying to master some of that. Um, his chord progressions are the best ever. Occasionally I just like to like play some of the music and then turn a tiny bit of it into one massive song because <laughs> uh, his stuff is really dense like that. So yeah, it's just again a mixture of classical music, heavy metal and um, alternative rock and a lot of Queens of the Stone Age always. We really wanted to explore new ideas and just take our time a bit more and do something that was really uh, musically stunning and unmissable rather than just a bunch of songs cobbled together. This is the first time that Gary has sung on an album where you can really hear him. He's I've never sung on any previous albums because I'm not a good singer. I've not got the most melodic voice and I had to do various takes in order to do this one. Uh, is it? Fuck's sake, forgot the cut in Oryx. That's fucking great! That's good! If I wasn't coerced into it by Mesh, I would never have done it. And I wouldn't feel comfy singing live. Singing to an audience is never racking. Even singing to a microphone, it doesn't feel natural to me. It doesn't feel natural. It's projecting the voice for it to be recorded. I don't know, it's fun, it's cool. It's, it's, it's cool being able to sing to an audience and just uh, stand up and do that. But it's, it's not something I could see myself doing before. When I'm playing live, I've got a guitar in front of me. I've got this barrier in front of me. When you're singing, you've not got that. You're kind of like exposed, you're a bit more naked. And you stand up there thinking, please fucking be in tune. It's like if, I, if I come in on the first note, it's way out of tune. I said, I'm going modified, I'm going home. As it happens, it's went quite well. I've had a good response from them. People have commented on it, so that's, I don't know, it's kind of, it's good when people compliment you. In any walk away, it's good when people compliment you. But if you're nervous about what you do and somebody compliments you, it sort of gives you confidence to carry on doing it, I suppose. So the next album, I'm going to be singing it. Mesh is out the window. So I'm going to be on. I'm writing songs, yeah, yeah, we don't need them. Love. I'm a victim of indulgence. Love. 
what it was, that part in the song, um, it was never intended to be heard by anyone, and we ended up sticking it in the middle of the title track, The World Conspires. Just recorded it, I just uh, went for it, it seemed like it kind of worked, I was nervous about it, because even when I heard it, I thought it's a shit. Just bought it, it's kind of that on an album. Especially against somebody else's voice, it, it's actually like spent years practicing their, their singing, their vocal technique, and thought you can't really have that, but as it happens, it kind of works, so... Maybe have it on the next album. Ideally, what we'll be doing is four part harmonies, and we'll be doing that live. And I could sing. I can see your demons praying. I can see the way they move inside you, but it won't shake me. Yeah, I'm staying. Now, as it turns out, our, our drummer Anna is a bit of a dark horse. She's able to sing. That's your love for me is real. And play piano very, very well. And when you find me there, you'll search no more. Don't tell me it's not worth fighting for. She might even play piano on the next album, you never know. Yeah, she might get some credits, why not? I'll see what else she could play. She could play the Melodian. Unfortunately, she's a fan of uh, Toto. And there's a video over on YouTube, should you wish to check out, of her playing Africa. So it's a lady of many skills, but um, in terms of singing, yeah, I imagine she will be singing on the next album. She's comfy singing and playing drums, and we're all comfy singing the parts that we're going to be writing for the album, yeah. We'll just kind of be like Queen, but more metal. Yeah. I definitely would like it to go heavier, but I wouldn't like to lose that really vulnerable side to Birdie's Baby as well, with the stripped back songs that you can hear, like Ropes on The World Conspires and Look Away are all quite uh, small songs. My main musical influences are definitely Pink Floyd, Tool and Opus. The manner in which they play guitar, whether I think about it or not, is kind of refers to them bands. Michael Ackerfeldt's guitar playing, Adam Jones's guitar playing, and uh, just Pink Floyd as a whole. Well, everything, even their drummers had an influence on the way I play rhythm. I've always kind of been into prog, but as the more I've more I've got into metal, I've, I, I play that on guitar. Right? When I'm practicing, I'll sit in like jam metal and jam various like uh, rock type stuff. So it's just. I try and, when I bring someone new to an album, it depends what I'm listening to at the time, and I was listening to a lot of Tool. But I wasn't a lot of Opus, I'm a massive Opus fan, so there was element, definitely elements of that. I was watching a video, they'd done a guitar playthrough. I can't remember the guitarist's name, sorry, but anyway. Anyway, they'd done a playthrough, and like, they were watching how they harmonised guitars together. And just watching that video, I thought, I'm having that, and that was the World Conspires. And all the guitars on the World Conspires were based on what I've seen on that Opus video, because I just sat watching it, I thought, that's, that's good. Over the last couple of years, uh, when we were writing The World Conspires actually, um, I started listening to um, a few bands that I hadn't really previously previously been into. Most of it was like Gary's influence. When you go on tour, you always like listen to each other's tunes. As it happens, Mesh was getting into Opeth as well. He was really into Opeth at the time and I just suddenly really got into their music. I was listening to, um, I think the album's called Watershed. Um, and then there's another one called Ghost Reveries that I was obsessed with for a good you know, eight months. I just made her listen to it again and again, because like she said, I don't really like this music, and I was like, well, you're wrong. So, you need to listen to it. As it turns out, she loves them now. She really, really likes them. So, that's definitely an influence on it. So, um, that's what I brought to the album in terms of music lyrics. I never wrote a lot of the lyrics, other than lines here and there. Majority, Mitch being the singer, she wrote most of the lyrics. Music lyrics, definitely elements of Tool, Opus and Pink Floyd. These last few years have been a very busy time for me. I've been working with 
quite a few varied projects. I've joined another band, which I don't know if I can announce yet, but it's quite similar to Birdie's Baby in the type of progressiveness. Um, I was also in a project called The Snow Witch, which has now developed into being a member of a Balkan Romani quartet. That kind of music has influenced a lot of tracks on Birdie's Baby, for example, Painkiller, all the like Eastern European influences. Another big event was that I started playing the harp, so this album's actually included harp in some of the tracks, Esmeralda. It's kind of an obvious track to include the harp because it's very stripped down, but a less obvious track is uh, Painkiller, which is probably the most metal track on the album, but we managed to add harp to it, so I'm quite impressed with us. <laughs> this album is a lot heavier because my old guitar was a Fender Stratocaster. It's a lovely guitar, it wasn't quite hitting the mark. But anyway, the reason I've got heavier sound is because I wanted this guitar, I wanted a PRS, I wanted a guitar with humbuckers in it that felt lovely. So I was able to just play heavier riffs, just make it sound a bit more aggressive. I felt Birdie's Baby needed it. It gives the band more depth if you got like uh, if you create like detuned riffs as well as having it light and orchestral. But a lot of the riffs, a lot of the riffs are quite uh, Michael Ackerfeld, Adam Jones esque. If it's a if I detune the guitar to drop D. Sounds like this. Drop D. That's definitely a reference to Tool because what their guitar, what their wrestling to do. Thank thing. That's uh, definitely the the Tool side coming out. Yeah, I think it's definitely going to go more progressive, probably a lot darker if we can, and uh, have some some new ideas in there. But um, I don't know how exactly to say uh, it, it'll it'll go more in that kind of heavy direction. Um, but I do have a solo project as well, so I like to just play out different ideas on that. And if I feel like the song is not quite fitting into the Buddy's Baby style, then I usually just put it into my solo work. Um, so right now I'm kind of writing. A klezmer blues Americana country record because <laughs> why not um, and then Birdie's Baby is gonna hopefully go down yeah, a bit more of a metal path but definitely progressive and still keep some of our like, softer songs as well Sorry, I've got to think about that. Um, 
Okay, I guess I'm gonna go with. Uh. Um, I'd say my favourite out. Uh... Okay, I'll go with Whisper. Um, but I think Box of Razor Blades is probably like the most obvious choice for that question. But I don't think the rest of the band members knew what I was doing with the song Whisper for quite some time. The one that I was probably most involved in was the actual title track, Royal Conspires. I'd say my favourite song on the album is Painkiller. Um, it's the first single we released and... Um, so I had this like really major kind of happy song. The lyrics are all about like um, escaping and running away together with someone, but you're kind of not running away into the distance like happily ever after, it's like running away into complete disaster. So yeah, that song is quite personal to me just because the lyrics, I think. I wrote them all by myself, you know, in this moment when I was experiencing um, these emotions. And when Mish first wrote the lyrics for that, for most of it, that song that was quite poignant. It's quite sort of beautiful to see on paper, to see these things. And then, well, we're, we're, we're writing them together as well, but I just actually read it on paper, so it's, just, it's actually real, what's happening. I just think it's a really cool track. It's really metal and it's got like Eastern influences and it's got really, really beautiful classical influences. And so we were doing all these like real classical runs in the piece and like just layering it up. And yeah, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> It's quite embarrassing to be witness on camera, but so be it. It was kind of just like, didn't feel like it was ever going to be real, anything was ever going to be happening in the relationship, the album. The way we were going, like I was, I was working in a construction, an absolute dead end job that I thoroughly despised. I couldn't see it ending, couldn't see anything that's coming to any fruition, anything coming, becoming, becoming good out of anything. And then all of a sudden it just started happening. And before I knew where it was, I, just, I was walking towards this sort of, this new future. Yeah, the World Conspires documents. In my mind, when I hear the lyrics, that's a very, that's a solid reminder of where I was, where we all were, when the album was being written. Yeah, and it's just cool. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Going back to the religious thing, there's uh, a lot of references, religious references in that one. There's uh, the Walls of Jericho story is in it, and then also the story about um, Lot, who was running away from uh, Gomorrah when it was burning, and uh, God tells him, don't look back. And one of his wives looks back and she turns into stone. So we've got a reference to that, and it's kind of about like just running desperately away into something, but it's kind of out of the frying pan into the fire, sort of thing. It's nice and natural. Yeah, yeah. nice and natural. Plus, also, if, it, if it's just cool, <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, like, it's cool. It's just That's cool. The most rock and roll thing you can say as well. Anyway. It's just cool. Like, why are you even asking that? <laughs> now we've got past that, now we're writing a new one. And I'm sitting chatting about it. <laughs> oh, that was a beautiful <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Since completing uh, The World Conspires, I definitely think it's changed us as a band uh, for the better. It was such a huge achievement when the album finally came out, when we finally completed it, when we finally had the master copies sent over, um, you know, and then the artwork was being put in place, and I really thought, Holy shit, we're gonna we're gonna actually put this album out now. Now that it's done, we can stop, take a breath, like you know, not take a break, but take a breath and uh, look back at what we've achieved. You know, it's five albums, and this last one nearly broke us. So it's been really nice uh, to look back on that and be really proud of that album, and still really love that album. Um, and also exciting because now we can look forward and do new things and look back at what we've done and what we've achieved and realise how much we've grown as people and how much we've grown as musicians as well. It's a huge achievement, definitely the biggest achievement we've ever had as a band and the fact that we're still doing it just means the world to all of us. I think we're a lot closer as a band and now with Anna we're a lot stronger musically as well. Anna's a great drummer so we're really excited to get back to the studio with her as soon as we possibly can. We have a great manager, Simon, who's always pushing us and, you know, working really hard for us. I don't know why, you know, we're just assholes. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, he's he's been amazing, really like behind the scenes kind of guy that you might not know is, is working so much for us, but he's really been a huge part of that. In fact, you can hear his uh, vocals on Esmeralda. I don't want you to be kind to me. He actually helped me write that song. He's got a credit on the album for the first time, so. Um, yeah, that was just a really nice part of it as well. He's definitely the unseen fifth member of Brody's Baby. 
the, the recording of this album was really special to us as well because we actually had the chance to work with John Fryer, who is a producer. Um, he's actually British, but he lives in LA now. And through a friend of ours, um, an Italian band called Belladonna, we hooked up with John. We were looking for somebody to produce the record and we were currently working with Paul Reeve, who uh, is one <clears throat> Muse's early producer. We really liked the sound that he did on uh, Showbiz and um, a few of their other tracks. And he actually produced Better Man, the EP that we did. But we felt like his sound was just a little bit too clean for us and we wanted someone who's a bit more rock and roll and rough around the edges and did really niche weird bands. And so John Fryer kind of came up on our radar. Um, I looked at his discography and he worked with Swans and Nine Inch Nails and Depeche Mode and just all these really, really dark, introverted, awesome bands that we're a huge fan of so we just thought you know what we've got to go for it he sent us a mix of painkiller and um it was just perfect it was really really intense and really full-on and really like nasty around the edges so we were like he's definitely the guy for us he did a really good job on all of the songs just having his name on the album has been fantastic for us as well because it's connected us to lots of other bands and just given us another contact in in la as well um i actually I flew out last January with Hannah to do NAM, which is like a music tech kind of um, conference. And he was there, so I actually got to spend some time with him and listen to the first mixes of Lady Grey. And that was really nice. I was quite nervous because he's such a, you know, uh, well-known producer. But that was a great experience working with him. It was definitely the best producer we've ever worked with and could only recommend him, you know, to um, other bands that we know. So. Um, yeah, I just want to give him a shout out and say a huge thank you to John Fryer because you can really hear his stamp on the album. Working with Scott Chalmers on the music videos um, was also an amazing experience. Um, we started working with him a few years back just on photo shoots here and there and then when he started getting more into music videos um, we really started getting on because his vision is also really dark, um, weird, kind of a bit sometimes aggressive looking uh, videos. Um, the way he shoots stuff is really, really tasteful um, and really, really high quality. We started working with him on a few videos and then basically it's just been one video after the other now. Every single time I have a concept, we're like, Scott, can you do this? And he's always like, yep, you know, <laughs> he's a man of few words. Um, he's done so many shoots with us now, but, uh, you know, He's really like such a great guy to work with. Now Hannah's done some music videos with him as well and we're sort of sending a lot of people his way because he's just such a great director. He's really easy to work with, really fun. His vision is fantastic. And he's been able to like build parts of the music video that we never would have been able to do ourselves. So for example, Hannah's harp video for um, Eurydice where she's spinning around, he actually built that platform. Um, and then poor Simon had to lie on the ground in a Superman position and like spin it around. <laughs> Uh, again, the unseen uh, force behind Verdi's baby and Hannah Piranha is Simon. But yeah, working with him has just been amazing. I want to give him a huge shout out because uh, really his, you know, his photos all over the cover um, artwork for The World Conspires and his music video, especially for Painkiller, which is just such a like fucking brilliant dark music video. That was all him. So yeah, thank you, Scott, for everything you've done for Birdie's Baby as well. We are definitely going to continue to work with you on Hex. So yeah, we can just look forward to uh, reinventing ourselves again, becoming creative again. You know, we're not so uh, confined by this album now. We're free to do kind of whatever we want to musically. I feel like we've reached a point with the band now where we've done we've done a lot that we can be really proud of. I don't feel like we've got a massive mountain to climb anymore. I feel like we're at the top and we can just look down and be like, ha ha, <laughs> uh, let's enjoy the view. We've already started working on the new record. It's gonna be called Hex. It's gonna be even darker. It's gonna be the darkest Birdies Baby album yet, which we say every album is gonna be the darkest Birdies Baby album yet. And I think each album has got darker. Um, so yeah, we're going to do some complex time signatures, lots of crazy uh, polyrhythms. Um, the album's going to be really introverted and strange. It's gonna, the songs are going to be really long. They're going to be um, definitely for the listener who wants something more um, to get involved with and really concentrate on. It's not going to be, um, you know, a flash in the pan kind of album. It's going to be really well thought out and constructed. Um, it's going to be uh, for the music theory geeks, you know. So, you know, we're really going to focus on our live act and our live performance, see if we can do something new with that. It's going to be a while before we can tour again because of the corona outbreak, um, but we're really looking forward to hitting the road with these songs. A uh, bit higher up, a bit further back, a bit higher up, a bit further back, a bit higher up, a bit lower down. <laughs>
<laughs> Doing this documentary has been great as well because it's just um, seeing all that come together. It really, you know, really does make you realise how much work has gone into the album. All of that footage, you know, started like three years ago. So um, it's really nice to see it all put together so nicely. Feels like just, you know. Just yesterday we were starting it out, but um, yeah, the truth is so different. <laughs> so working with a film crew, Matt Ast and Anna Gemma has been really cool for us actually, because it's the first time that we've had a documentary made that wasn't made by ourselves. Um, we're very much a DIY band, but um, it seems these days that we're getting more help than ever, which is really, really lovely. It was just amazing to look at the album, uh, you know, through someone else's eyes and have it pieced together, the documentary, you know, from the beginning of when the album started right to the end, right till now, and have somebody piece it together and present it back to you in a way that's, um, that you wouldn't have necessarily seen. Um, answering the questions was sometimes a little bit difficult. Yeah, so well, why, why do you qualm in front of the camera? Anyway, um... <laughs> and the lead singer, hold on, I'll do that again. Oh, it wasn't even recording. Yeah, so... You know, we are quite shy sometimes, I think, as artists, you know. As much as we express ourselves through songs, sometimes it's quite difficult to talk about the songs and to talk about the meaning behind it. So it was really nice to have somebody guide us through that. Um, and I think they've done a really amazing job. We'll definitely work with them again on another documentary, but perhaps it won't be how the world conspired. It'll be how Birdie's Baby conspired against the world. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just want to say a massive thank you to everyone who's supported us in any shape, form because you know we have had a lot of help as a band to get through all of these albums and to go on all of these tours and it would we would be nothing without our our fan base our flock so um to everybody to all our patrons to all our our friends families and all our fans and anyone who helps us um i just want to say a massive thank you from all of us at Birdix baby because you've really made this band what it is and here we are still conspiring so uh thank you and um hopefully there'll be another documentary soon Thank you.